questions are, would you like to take the word next? So, yeah, I had a few reflections on some of the other talks. I think uh, Pumlani's quote from uh, Milton and Rose Friedman, I thought, really encapsulated what we're talking about today, is that property rights are not indivisible from human rights. They are part of human rights and, by extension, civil rights. So your ability to participate actively in a democratic society is really uh, premised on your self-ownership, which extends to the right to own property. And, uh, yeah, so I think uh, that quote really captured uh, me from uh, Pumlani's presentation as well as uh, those, those three points that he uh, articulated by Tom Baller. I'm not sure actually who Tom Baller is, but uh, that in order for property rights to be efficient and effective, uh, you must have exclusivity, transferability, and enforceability. And the enforceability is really where the state comes in, in uh, providing the rule of law, and, uh, and the courts there, I think, play a really integral role. And I think uh, just uh, you know, getting to, to your presentation, I mean, it struck me that, that the state is trying to do too much, um, and that there are all these very ambitious uh, programs and policies with very complicated acronyms, uh, but the outcomes are not really uh, uh, materializing as government itself and Minister de Diza um, confesses. Um, and I think, you know, what we need to do is kind of spread that power down and out and uh, empower individuals to improve their own circumstances. And, you know, I think uh, something that has always pleasantly surprised me is that South African farmers uh, have succeeded in spite of uh, the state and not because of it. And uh, unlike in other countries, and South Africa is competing with these countries in the global commodities markets, uh, you know, South African farmers don't have very much by way of subsidies or uh, import protections and things like that. Um, and so that shows you that through human ingenuity, uh, latent knowledge, um, and by exploiting technology and the availability of capital, uh, South African farmers can compete globally um, and off of their own steam. And so I think government needs to do more by doing less. And uh, it's a bit of a Zen message. Um, and you know, there's no shortage of master plans throughout various sectors of the economy and in the, in the industrial sector as well. Um, but ultimately, these are all state-led. They're premised on uh, state involvement. And the state is not uh, apolitical or an impartial actor. It has its own interests, its own objectives. Uh, transformation, for example, is a very loaded uh, concept. Um, so, you know, I think we should recognize the role of the state in enforcing uh, contracts and property rights, but we should also advocate for a more limited function in terms of uh, agricultural supply chains and, and the agricultural sector and uh, you know, give the, the power back to, to the people. And yeah, just a final observation. I really loved Fernando de Soto's metaphor of the 800-pound gorilla. And what we need is, is rather 800 gorillas. And uh, there's, there's kind of a power in numbers there. Um, uh, yeah, so overall, some fantastic contributions from the, the panel. Turning now to Mr. Nzlara to defend his good name and that of the Free Market Foundation, <laughs> maybe that's going too far. Yeah. But I think Amy possibly may have already brought in some information that yes. would be useful to you. Yeah, so I, I sometimes attend events like these and I tell people that I'm a proud capitalist and it causes them to clutch their pearls. Uh, but it's not, not very often that I'm accused of not being capitalist enough. Uh, so that's quite refreshing. Uh, but actually, I, I do think that you have a strong point there. And, you know, the Thatcher administration, uh, when it's... Uh, implemented that uh, council estate uh, program, the, the selling of those council estates, you know, earned, I, I think it was in excess of 20 billion pounds uh, in revenue for the Treasury, um, which uh, in the South African context, I mean, Amy pointed out that uh, South Africa's uh, debt profile, its sovereign debt, is to the tune of 350 billion rand. And over the medium-term expenditure framework, the finance minister, he highlighted that the debt-to-GDP ratio is going to climb to about 73% of GDP. Um, so that's really unsustainable. Um, and even though, you know, the fiscal, relative fiscal austerity that the minister has implemented, 
it's just not going to go far enough. And so, uh, you know, as, as we know, the energy crisis, municipalities, some of them have uh, debts to the tune of billions of rands that they owe to ESCOM. So this, that, your proposal, what you're saying, Muleti, is potentially a trick that the government is missing. And I would say from your lips to President Ramaphosa's ears, um, I think that would be, it, it, that would probably put the Kailam project out of business, but we wouldn't mind that very much. But you know, I frankly don't see that happening anytime soon. So in the interim, you know, you have this historical uh, council stock uh, that the municipality has no need for. And, you know, by handing that over to the people who have resided in those properties for generations, you now, you now uh, improve the liquidity of that asset, you introduce it into the market, that person can sell that property immediately. Um, that then will improve the overall liquidity of the property market. Um, and, you know, uh, I think that the state itself owns a lot of property. Uh, the Department of, of Defense owns a lot of property. Uh, the state is probably the, the largest landowner in the country. So, uh, you know, it could, that land could be utilized a lot more effectively in the hands of the poor. Uh, I think that there would be no problem with selling that uh, to the poor. But look, uh, as a consequence of our low economic growth, uh, many poor people just simply wouldn't have the means uh, to afford that, as Amy points out. Um, but, you know, I think the, uh, the potential gains are, are quite high. And, yeah, you know, just another final point. Some of the beneficiaries of our program are quite elderly. Uh, some of them in their 90s or even in their hundreds um, simply wouldn't have the means to, uh, to do that. Um, and, you know, I think also the the picture is a little bit mixed. So, for example, in the Western Cape, uh, the then uh, government built uh, council homes for those people who ended up residing in them. But in Paris and Kronstadt and places like that in the Free State, people were just kind of put on a, a patch of vacant land and, had, and often built their own homes. So they have invested their own capital, their own hard work in those homes. Why should they not have full ownership over that? Uh, so, look, I think the Kailam program will continue indefinitely until uh, Mr. Ramaphosa becomes Ms. Thatcher, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. <laughs> a great way to end that little comment. Um, I'm going to try and follow it up and say I've rarely been at a conference where Milton Friedman and Karl Marx are both used to support the same point. Um, <laughs> so, thank you to <laughs> Mr. Stewart. Um, so, so that's just my own view that we've got to have some mechanisms to determine who are we talking about. It can't be just the Khoisan, the, the Khoisan people, the, the black people. What, we can't generalize at that abstract level. Can I come in uh, just with another point, which is, you know, since about 1995, the Reconstruction and Development Program, uh, you know, the state embarked on a massive housing program. And... Uh, you know, today we have the Department of Human Settlements, which is a, I always find a bit of a strange uh, name for a, for a department. Um, but you know, those RDP houses, there is an eight-year prescription period on those on those houses. So the beneficiaries, uh, the people who eventually get a house from the government, uh, usually uh, the house is poorly constructed because of the tender that uh, went out uh, was acquired through some kind of corrupt means. Uh, so the house itself is not particularly good. But when you, when you do take occupancy, if you're lucky enough to find yourself at the top of the very long list, uh, then you're not allowed to sell that asset uh, for eight years. So uh, if you get a job in another part of town, you, you know, that's two hours away, well then tough luck, you, you're not allowed to sell and, and move. So what happens is uh, this uh, produces an illicit market of, of people renting out their homes or, or, or selling it on. Uh, so why not just, if, if, if you're going to take that step to invest state resources, um, and I take Muleti's uh, point that that's probably not the best use of state resources, well then give them the freedom, uh, give them the agency to, to actually do with that asset what they please. I, I do find it very interesting in the discussion around ancestral 
ownership of land is that it, there always seem to be two different aspects, at least, that are, get muddled. One is around the dignity and the sense of belonging on the one hand, and on the other hand, the, the desire to be an economic agent that can improve their own lot. And the one is identity-driven, and is, it's a legitimate identity question. What makes me believe that I'm valuable as a human being? And the second one says, similarly, what can I do as a human being that makes me feel valuable and more valuable? And these two discussions are often in ugly ways, mixed up, um, which is maybe somebody wants to come in on that later on. Okay, the second historical question, or historical, historically facing question here is really, um, the World Bank apparently commented that one of our economic constraints is the result of dispossession and exclusion in South Africa. And that historical exclusion on property ownership should be seen as a present problem rather than a, a current problem, and it should be faced as a policy problem um, directly. So saying exclusion is not, simply, not just simply a human rights issue, but it's also an economic constraint. I think that's the way that the question was posed. Are there any thoughts about that on the panel? Well, if the no takers, I mean, you know, currently we have this raging debate about expropriation without compensation, which I understand will be dealt with extensively in the latter half of the conference, so I don't want to go there too much. But what, all I'd say to that is the answer is to strengthen property rights, not to dilute them. If history has shown us that infringing on private property rights has been so damaging and has limited our economic potential, then the counter to that is do more to strengthen property rights rather than abrogate them. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think we, we, and Amy made a, a good point, you know, if, we, if we're going to be going back endlessly to history, uh, we can end up in the Garden of Eden, uh, and then we, we have to blame all the women for tempting, <laughs> <laughs> for tempting the man with the apple. <laughs> so the reality of our situation, as I point out, my own ancestors did not lose their land to white people. They lost their land to the Zulus. <laughs> I am Zulu, what are you saying? Uh, well, well, now, What's you going see, on now? You, you see my point. So we, I come from the Eastern Cape, but our land was expropriated by the Zulu army at the beginning of the 19th century because we, our ancestors or the leadership of our, did not want to join King Shaka's uh, empire, which, which is we are seeing on, on television <laughs> now. So King Shaka then chased them away. Some of them ended up in Zimbabwe, as, as in Debele. Others ended up in the, in the Eastern Cape. So we lost our land to, to the Zulu. Now, should I go to, to Pumlan and kick him out of, of his house and say, now, I come from the Eastern Cape. You, the Zulus, took my land. Uh, therefore, I'm going to kick you out of your house. You can take uh, his parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> that I've just built. Yes, I one. want his penthouse. <laughs> no, his, history and so, justice demands so, it, that so you transfer. Now, we, we have to understand that the reality of South Africa is the reality of South Africa. The the capitalist system and our history, of course, you know, people, the Africaners lost a huge amount of land, of their assets. With, from the British Army, the British Army destroyed a big part of their wealth during the Anglo-Boer War. Now, are we going to be sitting here crying about the Africaners and saying that, uh, I don't know, they should go to England and ask for reparation from the British? then we'll be wasting our time. We have a reality of a South Africa today, and our challenge is to, re to inc build an inclusive economy that includes everybody, so that we don't have 42% of our population that is excluded from economic activity. I can't, you know, one of the famous British economists 
said, under capitalism, the worst thing for you is not to be exploited by capital. So we have to bring this population into production and therefore uplift their standard of living. If we're going to spend our energies crying about what happened in, in, in history in the past, me fighting against the Zulus, asking for my ancestral land, then we will never get anywhere. The Afrikaners fighting with the British, saying they want reparation for the destruction of their farms during the anglo Boer War, then we will, we, will not get, we will not get anywhere. We have a capitalist economy. We have to modernize the capitalist economy of South Africa. And to modernize the capitalist economy of South Africa, because that's the way, only way we can include the 42% that is excluded. Because that's brain power that is being wasted. So to modernize the, this capitalist economy, the economy of affection, that is what I was looking for, has to go. We can't have both a capitalist economy that is globally competitive as well as an economy of affection, which is subsistence. We can't have it both ways. If we don't want to modernize our country, okay, fine, then let's decide. We want to be an economy of affection. We don't want to be a modern economy. And how we arrive at that conclusion, I don't know.